I am here in the house where Charles Darwin uh, did his great work on evolutionary biology and we've just seen a copy of the Times of 1859 reviewing his book The Origin of Species and I'm here with Paul Flather and with Perry Marshall and it's extraordinary to be able to come to the very place where Charles Darwin did all of his great work his various books and publications. What's your impression of all of this, Perry? Well, my impression is that there, there's there's kind of a, a romantic notion of Darwin, um, who, and, and I think a lot of it is, is kind of a sense of overturning myth and superstition and getting yes. us getting us on to, to real science. And, you know, I think I think one thing that's usually missing from these conversations is how, um, what would the word be, H how um, tentative Darwin was exactly about most of his pronouncements. He felt forward, didn't he, yeah. progressively, with all kinds of doubts in his own mind. And I think he only in the end published The Origin of Species in 1859 because Wallace, who was out there in the Malay of Picalago, mm. you know, finding much the same theory, selection, natural selection and so on, was on, hot on his heels. That's what made him publish yeah. eventually. Yes, that's true. I think one of the things that does strike me walking around is, is how much hands-on Darwin was. He I was, mean, you, wasn't you, he? Yes. You know, you can can get lost in thinking that it's all about sitting in, in your study and yes. uh, <laughs> just, you know, imagining these wonderful concepts and so on. But here he is out in his greenhouse looking at uh, these kind of carnivorous plants, or yes. experimenting with primroses, and yes. just, just seeing him, you know, him getting his hands dirty, literally. Exactly um, so. And, and I yes. think that plays to this point of taking time because, you know, he'd have to watch plants slowly grow and, and, and measure their changes and establish, establish the kind of um, difference, measure yes. the difference in, in, in little plots of land. It takes time. It takes Patience. time. Patience. And I think he learnt this also in that six-year voyage of the Beagle, mm. all the way down the coast mm. of South America to the very tip and then all the way up again on the Pacific side to arrive at the Galapagos Islands. He did the same thing, mm. which was to look at all of this, mm. carefully note it, mm. put it down, mm. put it in together with the stuff he took back with him to England. And it was only when he got back to England that somebody said to him, hey, wait a minute, mm. each of the islands has a different kind of bird beak. Mm. Mm. Darwin himself, he says this actually in mm. his letters, mm. you know, you know I am a rather slow thinker. Mm. But I think that slowness was also his great virtue. He didn't jump mm. just for the simplest explanation. Mm. He was a very, very careful. And thinker. even after he, there's quotes, isn't there? Even after he'd written his great work, he was. He said when people criticised him, he said, "Oh well, I was a bit rushed. You know, I, That's right, I, exactly. I, I probably, you know, I probably." Um, should yes. have taken more care on this section. Or, yes. or, well, you know, he started quite, revising. Quite, quite and that's, that's why much later, 1868, so nearly 20 years mm. is that after... No, 1859 to 1868 is only nine years, isn't it? Mm. But nine years later, he starts thinking about the question, could there, after all, be a way in which the body could tell the germ line to communicate down to the progeny mm. some of the characteristics that had been acquired and he invented his theory of gemules. We discovered them. You and I, Perry, have discussed this. It's mm. just remarkable. I mean, it's as big a discovery as the discovery of capillaries after Harvey said there is a circulation, but he mm. couldn't see where the two bits connect, mm. how the mm. veins and arteries connect. So he said there has to be something there. Yes. It has to be just that we can't see it. Mm. And that's exactly what Darwin mm. said, which is there have to be particles that pass all the way down to the germ line. We just can't see them. They're too tiny. Now, you know, the interesting thing is Lamarck said exactly the same thing. He didn't call them gemules, he called them subtle fluids. But that's exactly what he meant, precisely the same. Well, I, I've had a lot of conversations with people about 
evolution, and I've talked about how there's a revolution going on in evolutionary biology. And I have some people say to me, there's no evol there's like no other theory of evolution. There's just always been the theory of evolution. We just kept adding things to it. But what you're actually pointing out, it's not it's not necessarily obvious so far in this conversation, is it's a complete reversal of the cause and effect Indeed. of the way people think about evolution because yes. evolution is always described in textbooks and television shows and everything as evolution through natural selection, but that's mm. actually backwards. It's actually natural selection through evolution mm. and you, evolution. You can't have the natural selection without the variation. Right. And then the big question is, what are the causes of that variation? Mm. Is it entirely the genes, mm. which is the standard theory? Yes. Right. Or is it that many other processes are involved as well? Mm. That's where the debate is now. Mm. That's that's right. And and so when 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 you're observing that we now know about exosomes and we now know that uh, that changes in the physical body can then be transferred to the germ line, yes. that is that is radical. Now, Indeed, the the, the right. best the best example I've ever heard of this. I. Uh, have a friend that I'm pretty sure you know, uh, John Torday. Oh yes, indeed. Um, yes, he's yes. a he's been studying for 30 years the effects of secondhand smoke on children. Right. He so we had lunch one day and there's 300 different effects wow. of secondhand sure. smoke. And he said, "Would you like to guess what the number one effect is?" And I said, "I have no idea." Mm -hmm. And he said, "It is epigenetic." changes in a child from a smoking grandmother okay so let, let so let, let me take that apart okay. so that is quite interesting. so a woman smokes her body develops all kinds of uh, physiological responses to protect itself from the smoke those get passed through the egg those changes that that are contextual they get passed to her daughter, who passes them again through the egg to the granddaughter. So now the original woman who smoked very well may have died, may have never met the grandchild, and the grandchild theoretically could have never even been in a room with a smoker, mm, yeah. but the granddaughter has asthma that she inherited epigenetically from her, her grandmother. Mm. And now this is this is a radical change in how we understand of ev evolution because for example Hawaii has 10,000 species of insects and 9700 are unique to Hawaii well it's not because god sent 9700 unique species to Hawaii and it's not because natural selection all by itself just did this mm -hmm. it's because 24-7 very subtle changes and adjustments in the mm. physiology are in some cases being passed to the offspring mm. and that this has been going on all over the ecosystem mm. for three billion years mm. and so when people talk about evolution as being constantly adapting I, it's like people sort of intuitively know this but generally it's never been verbally recognized it isn't, uh, for what it actually generally is generally recognized largely because the person who originated these ideas that is jean baptiste lamarck mm. a great french mm. evolutionary biologist was rubbished mm. yes and that is the dilemma we face today mm. uh, can you expand on that uh, explain mm. How his reputation was handled? Well, his reputation was rubbished right at the time of his funeral. Okay. Lamarck died extremely poor. He was given a pauper's burial, thrown essentially into a lime pit. And what was read at his funeral was an oration that was written by his great opponent on evolution, that was Cuvier. Cuvier thought that there were separate periods of creation. That was his way of explaining no. the fossil record, you see. Mm. 
That's rather like Marx's status of, of development. Something like, which, was, which was quite a common way of explaining history, actually. Exactly, days, that's right. Big sort of... In step yeah. changes. Which is not actually totally mm. untrue. No, I no. mean, there is, of course, a proper theory. Mm. It was Gould mm. who developed it of the saltationary mm. form of evolution. So Cuvier was not entirely wrong, but he was deliberately attempting to denigrate Lamarck. And at Lamarck's funeral, this oration, which echoes down the centuries, because you can still find it online today, and see how Lamarck was denigrated even at his funeral. That's the big problem. So that can be your next uh, big task, I think, is to rehabilitate. We're already talking about rehabilitating Darwin, aren't yes. we? Because we think the that real Darwin, Darwin. Darwin, yeah, right. Darwin has been <laughs> yes, trounced absolutely. and trashed. The real and actually, Darwin. sitting here, yes. you do get a much. I mean, the sun has come out as well. You get yes. a much warmer feeling about the mm -hmm. the all roundness of Darwin, indeed, and, so. and rather than the kind yes. of narrow, um, yes. progressive natural selection theory that kind of emerged. Exactly, but it's also a form of rehabilitation exactly. of Jean Baptiste. So, but then you've got yes. this. I think, well, I think this is yeah. more, uh, even more special because there'll be lots of people in rehabilitating Darwin. Yes. But perhaps you're the first person to really focus on, on the neglect of Lamarck. And we actually talked about that it might be politically relevant. He yes, was exactly. out of favour. He was out of favour. And then the, in a very disrupted but essentially the, leftist yes. century. He, le he lived through the French he, he Revolution. It would have been quite... Yes. quite uh, uh, but anyway, a last word from you, Perry. <laughs> well, it... If can I ask you another question? Because yeah, I okay, means, so yes. Yes. so Darwin believed that acquired characteristics could be passed down, yeah. just like Lamarck did. Yes. He got the idea from yes, Lamarck. Indeed. Um, and then Dar th that was almost like erased, or was like, oh yeah, well Darwin had it mostly right, but he got this wrong, and now we know better. And then that became the standard evolutionary yes. theory for yes. almost the whole 20th century. Can you explain yeah. how that ended up grossly distorting Darwin's true legacy? The, the key to this is August Weissmann. He was a geneticist from Germany who in 1883 gave a lecture which has also echoed down through the next hundred years or so. And in that lecture he said... I have noticed that Darwin, I'm paraphrasing, I don't use the exact phrase, but he said, I've noticed that in his Origin of Species, Darwin has several places where he clearly assumes the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Mm. I think that is entirely wrong because there is no way in which the germ line can be receiving any information from the rest of the body. How did he know that? He didn't know that. He said it was necessarily true. This is strange for a scientist. Mm. But that became the foundation stone of the modern synthesis, or neo-Darwinism. When the great... There's and no they, barrier. There's, barrier there's there. a barrier. Yeah. The Weissmann barrier, yeah. yes. Well, that barrier has now been completely passed mm. through by what we now know can pass down to the germ line. Mm. But I think that what then happened was that people thought, well, it's a terribly simple theory. It was almost like the Occam's razor argument, you know. Don't complexify beyond where you have to. Yeah. Now, that's sometimes a very useful mm. process in science, but I think in this case it was the great mistake. The mistake was August Weissmann. Mm. Well, so where we're at now... <coughs> Sorry well into the 21st century is we can now edit genes as easily as a blog post and there's all kinds of genetic engineering going on exactly and the what has been drilled in everyone's heads for the last hundred years is that it's just natural selection natural selection the, the, nature doesn't have any other particular direction that it's trying to go and that acquired characteristics are not inherited. And we find out this is wrong. Of course, you get into how this actually works. It's, it's exponentially, extraordinarily complex. Indeed. Um, but there's a lot of scientists that are assuming that we're, we are smarter than this process. And we are not. And uh, we could be on the cusp of making some very, very large 
irreversible mistakes mm -hmm. yeah. if yeah. we don't have the kind of humility that Darwin exactly so. himself had. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. So we're broadcasting this from the very place where Charles Darwin wrote his Origin of Species and many of his other books, Down House in Kent in England.